and today's webinar is going to be conducted by Dr. Mridhubashni Govindarajan. Welcome Dr. Mridhubashni for this program. Thank you for having and me. Of introducing Dr. Mridhubashini, actually there is no need for me to introduce Madam. Formal introduction of Dr. Mridhubashini Govindarajan. Doctor has done her FRCS and FICOG. And she is the clinical director of Women's Center, Coimbatore. Dr. Mridhubashini Govindarajan graduated from Stanley Medical College, Chennai. Did her PG training at University of Manitoba, Canada. And she is the teaching faculty at University Teaching Hospitals in Winnipeg, Canada. Dr. Mridhubashne was the former Associate Professor of PSG, former Adjunct Professor of Tamil Nadu, Dr. MGR Medical University. And as all of us know, Dr. is the invited speaker at national and international conferences. And Dr. has won a lot of awards for her good work, like you no know, Lifetime Achievement Award from Tamil Nadu MGR Medical University, Lifetime Achievement Award from COGS and IMA Coimbatore, and very recent award, uh, which I remember is no in ISA 2020, Madam was given the Lifetime Achievement, Achievement Award. And Dr. Mridhubashni Govindarajan is the member of ISA, ESHRE, ASRM, POXI, IMA, and CIA Healthcare Panel. And Dr. was also given the Best Women Entrepreneur Award also. So I am sure today's um, webinar will be very interesting and useful for all of us. Thank you, doctor, once again, and over to Dr. Mridhubashini. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this evening, sharing about one hour with everybody in India, all, all over India. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity for doing it. And the topic that we've got in front of us today is a very common topic. The topic that we've got is polycystic ovary syndrome, how do you manage? And I'm sure it's something that you've heard a million times before. But yet, sometimes when you have the patient sitting in front of you, it is a puzzle. Where do I go? What do I prescribe? What, or what do I not prescribe? How long do I give it? And how much do I give? And when do I stop? All this becomes an issue. So this is just another way of managing PCOS based on the pathophysiology of what PCOS is. And I think we'll get started on what the pathophysiology is. Uh, first of all, I think we have to remember that PCOS is a syndrome. It's not a disease. A disease is caused by a single agent like the COVID-19 that we have here. There is an agent and a disease and a cure and may or may not be there. But syndrome is something different. And this particular syndrome is not an ovarian problem as the name denotes that we all know. It's a metabolic problem. But however, the ovary takes the blame for PCOS uh, quite unwarrantedly in many minds and uh, especially the pa patient's minds and it's something that we, we have to be first of all very clear about that the problem is not the ovary the problem is metabolic and actually it's supposedly to be renamed uh, currently one of the names that is being proposed is reproductive metabolic syndrome which is probably a much more appropriate name for this particular pathology what exactly is this and why does it matter and why should we actually know where it starts and how it happens and pathophysiology is such a dry thing anyway what is why should we be knowing about it i think it is important in this situation for us to understand what pcos is it is basically there is a genetic trait trait and the genetic trait unlike a lot of, a lot of other situations is not a single gene it involves multiple genes and the multiple genes are generally genes which uh, control a lot of the hormones, it's centrally occurring horm uh, hormones as well as peripheral hormones and uh, their receptors as well. So hormones and receptors are the ones uh, where the, the genes controlling them are responsible. And then if there is a genetic problem in one of those things or multiple one of them, it can give rise to the, this situation. It's the origin of this situation. I'm talking about the multiple genes because as you very well know, it is not the same disease in everybody that you see in front you know the patient is sitting in front of you not everybody has the same uh, signs and symptoms it's something that is so variable that sometimes you're stumped to know whether they in fact even have a uh, polycystic ovary syndrome or not so when we understand that it's not just one gene and in every single individual the genetic combination is different it sort of becomes easier for us to understand this variation in the presentations on top of the variations, there is 
an epigenetic, congenital or environmental factors which act on these genetic traits and modify them. So there are minimum of two interactive factors which are required for this disorder to manifest in any one individual. First of all, you have to have a genetic trait and second, you have to have the epigenetic factors uh, which uh, modify what you've inherited in your genes. So where does this epigenetic factors come in and how does it come in and how does it modify? These epigenetic factors again are very variable in each individual and it can be even in utero. In utero when the uh, girl child is in her mother's uterus and is exposed to a higher level of testosterone, possibly uh, what is present in her mother who's a PCO, it can modify the female child's uh, genes as well. So in utero environment can change it. The birth weight of the baby can change it. Birth weight of the baby, the small for dates babies and the large for dates babies. In the postnatal period, both of them um, behave in an abnormal metabolic way. Uh, Barker's hypothesis in the low birth weight babies, when they start putting on weight, they put on too much weight. And they are the ones who are more prone for metabolic syndrome as well. So that can do that. And a baby of a GDM uh, mother, uh, which is overweight and uh, remains overweight from birth also can have a problem. So the underweight baby can run into problems later. It, it will have its genes much more modified. And an overweight baby also, the same thing happens. But the key change happens in the adolescent stage of the individual. This is why when we are seeing these patients, we, we don't diagnose PCO at birth or in very early childhood usually. It's somewhere around adolescence is where the, the disease becomes or the syndrome becomes manifest. And what happens around the time of uh, uh, when the uh, puberty comes in? So around the time of puberty, what happens is that the hormones do kick in and change. And there are two very important things happen. With the serotonin and GABA changes, the proportion of uh, GNRH, where the FSH and LH in pulse frequency changes. And when the pulse frequency changes, it changes in fa favor of more LH, and that can act on the ovary and give rise to hyperandrogenemia. So this is one of the pathologies, and the hyperandrogenemia, then the high androgen levels itself can increase the insulin, the peripheral circulation needle. And both of them together cause the chronic anovulation. So it's a central defect that starts the whole thing. But there's another thing that happens, which is insulin resistance as well. So in some people, it's the androgen levels which go high, and in some people, it's the uh, insulin levels that, that go high. It's because of the defect being at the insulin receptor level where the glucose is unable to enter a cell. And it, because the, and there is a hyperglycemia and in response to the hyperglycemia, the pancreas puts out too much of insulin and there is too much of insulin floating around in the blood because of the receptor problem. So there is uh, insulin resistance, which is an underlying factor as well. And uh, these increased insulin levels have a negative effect on almost every organ and its function. It can be the ovary, it can be the adrenal, both of which again put out more uh, androgens in response to the increased insulin levels. And the liver where uh, the hormone binding globulins change for the negative way. So the available hormone levels again change outside adipose tissue, muscle, endometrium. All of these things suffer because of the hyperinsulinemia. At puberty, there is an awakening of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. There is an increased growth hormone spurt in this, in this period in time in life. And that is why the growth spurt happens and the increased growth hormone increases the insulin resistance even more. And it does it in the liver and in the muscle. And uh, that can lead to the hyperinsulinemia and the negative effects that we're talking about. And we already talked about the increased LH and uh, the LH effect of the increased LH on the ovary and increased androgens. So at the end of it, in puberty, obesity can make it worse as well, the insulin resistance worse. And obesity-driven hyperinsulinemia, overproduction of androgens lead to more obesity, perpetuating a vicious circle. So the insulin increases the androgens more, androgens increase the insulin more. So it becomes a self perpetuating cycle where these two becomes the crux of the reason why a PCO young lady becomes uh, manifests the symptoms and signs of PCO, hyperandrogenemia and hyperinsulinemia.
but however it's not the same in everybody some people the hyperinsulinemia is much more prominent depending on the genes affected and then the environmental effect in some people the androgen levels are more and that is why when you see your uh, multiple variety of PCOS patients in your OPD some of them tend to be obese and some of them tend to have obvious insulin resistance uh, manifested in them and some of them display the hyperandrogenemia much more with androgenization and the hirsutism more so it's not always the same but it can be a blend of it in any which way in which case each individual according to their, their own genetic make makeup is going to have a different manifestation so basically what it gives rise to is a multi-gene metabolic and a chronic inflammatory disorder as well all of these hormonal changes especially the insulin and the androgen which is more makes the individual have a chronic inflammatory disorder as well and that can explain a lot of other things in that, that happen in life much later as well so this manifests in several different ways from childhood and adolescence it can be visceral obesity adipose tissue dysfunction premature adenarche you know there are sometimes these young girls even at age seven or eight can have pubic hair and that may be a very very early indication of pcos as well and the irregular menstrual cycle with onset of menarche is the most common one of the most common things that we see clinically a little bit later in life it is infertility and further on when the woman gets more uh, older and closer to menopause it is the other metabolic uh, problems which become very prominent with more obesity and diabetes and hypertension and dyslipidemia endometrial cancers and breast cancer because of higher estrogen levels also happen so it's a whole spectrum of disorders but we'll look at the early part of the disorder first so when all of these different things happen um, adolescents we talked about them, what do they manifest and what do they come to us we come adolescent usually comes to us with menstrual disturbances amenorrhea uh, irregular heavy bleeding it may be amenorrhea period of time irregular menstruation followed by heavy bleed which doesn't stop with the usual kind of treatment and sometimes it can be an oligomenorrhea as well so these are the common complaints that they come to us with there's another category where it comes with uh, hirsutism alopecia and acne and there may be any combination where one is more prominent than the other depending on which factor is more prominent in that individual obesity can be a primary factor or a secondary factor as well a little later in life it's the infertility patient who has not been diagnosed before that we see in our clinics and of course it's very seldom that we start diagnosing pcos and much later in life but that is also possible a young woman younger than usual coming in with the endometrial cancer we have to think about pcod breast cancer risk also increases in a certain age group now when there are so many different things which are happening how do we even diagnose it and i think it goes back to something i'm sure all of us know but i will say it again because i think it needs to be emphasized again and again even though uh, this happened um, uh, a decade and more ago the asrm and ashre the two premier organizations uh, that uh, deal with endocrine problems and infertility problems sat together many experts the worldwide sat together and came up with criteria which they decided was the right criteria to diagnose PCOS because they thought the diagnosis of PCOS was not being done right. It was either being missed or being overdiagnosed. So they came up with uh, recommendations. This is a world body. Prior to that, there were other definitions as well. But currently in the last decade, I think the whole world accepts uh, Tortillam criteria as their definition. But I think we all have to, even people in general practice who are looking after uh, these women have to be very familiar with it. And I still find that there is people who are practicing in the periphery who don't have access to this kind of a knowledge are still not very clear about this. But I think this is a must. Otherwise, we tend to have all kinds of problems in our treatment modalities. One is oligo uh, or an ovulation. The second one is hyperandrogenism, which can be either clinical or biochemical. Polycystic ovary as diagnosed by ultrasound, more than 12 follicles, 2 to 9 mm in diameter, and an ovarian volume of more than 10 cc during the period of ovarian quiescence. So these ultra, this ultrasound is not a random ultrasound. It has to be done in the early part of the cycle when you can count the antral follicles, uh, uh, when, you, when you can do an antral follicle count, which is the follicles which are 2 to 9 mm in 
diameter and you have to have at least two or the three criteria present to make a diagnosis i'm i cannot emphasize it more because even today we see a lot of patients where the entire diagnosis of pco gets made on the basis of a random ultrasound examination done at any part of the cycle and it's usually done by a sonologist and it's usually done with a uh, abdominal probe in a young woman and i can i do have to uh, tell the story of uh, somebody a youngster that goes in with an abdominal pain to a general physician or a surgeon and gets referred for uh, ultrasound and gets told that she's got a polycystic ovary and that may be the reason for the pain or may or may not be the reason for the pain and it becomes a label that we put on them and we are definitely definitely not justified in putting that kind of a label on a youngster on the basis of an ultrasound ultrasound alone does not make a diagnosis of pcos it's in fact the least important of all the three uh, is the ultrasound picture of a polycystic ovary and that has to comply with the description so if you find a statement from your sonologist just calling it a multicystic ovary or a polycystic ovary please ignore it because you need to have a volume documented and you need to have the number of follicles documented having said this i must also add now this has undergone a lot of modifications um, with ongoing time and it's been around for several years now the main one of the main things which has changed is the number of follicles currently the number of follicles have increased from 12 to even to about 20 because just because of the fact that ultrasound machines are much more powerful now and people who are trained in ultrasound also are much more capable of doing it so the, we are able to be, pick up many many more uh, follicles in the ovary we are capability of picking up follicle has become more. So currently there are people who label 20 as the number as well. But how do you diagnose PCOS in the adolescent who comes to you? This 16 uh, year old who comes to you, how do you then diagnose? Is it the same three criteria, two out of the three, or is it going to be different? It has to be different because hyperandrogenism, acne is very common in adolescents. And hirsutism takes a longer time to develop. Even if they have uh, putting out a lot more, more uh, androgens, it takes a longer time to develop. So often you don't uh, find a very young girl having a lot of hirsutism. Irregular cycles and anovulation are common in adolescents. 85% of the cycles are anovulatory in the first year after menarche. About 60% of the cycles are anovulatory even after the third year, three, three years after menarche. And the ultrasound findings are very in inconsistent because she's anovulatory. She tends to have more large follicles sitting in the ovary and the ovarian volume can look higher. It may make it difficult even to count the AFCs. So what do we do now? You know, all of the three criteria are not going to be very accurate. What do we do now? Uh, the criteria has also been defined for diagnosing uh, PCOS in adolescents, where uh, it's claimed that all three of the Rotterdam criteria should be present. The first one is oligomenorrhea and anovulation. It should be present for at least two years after menarche or primary amenorrhea up until the age of 16 years. It could be primary amenorrhea as well. The young woman who comes in with no periods and maybe obesity, maybe um, hirsutism, you'll have to think about uh, the possibility of a PCO as well. Uh, hyperandrogenism, it should be biochemical evidence rather than clinical signs should be present. So clinical signs, again, because the acne is very, very common and hirsutism, it's too early. So biochemical evidence is also trusted more. And ultrasound diagnosis, increased ovarian size as well as the increased stroma. When you have an increased size, it should not be because three big follicles sitting in there. It should be the stroma. So that needs to be looked at as well. So defining PCOS also and diagnosing PCOS is something that we have to do extremely carefully in this age group and we've talked about it primary amenorrhea beyond 15 or 16 secondary amenorrhea 90 days over 90 days without a menstrual period oligomenorrhea which is infrequent you can call it an aub the first year after the onset of periods if you have cycles more than 90 days which is less than four periods per year second year if it's less than six periods per year third year it's less than eight periods per year and beyond that it's less than nine periods per year would be the definition of abnormal menstrual cycles. Clinical hyperandrogenism is the next thing. You know, first you look at uh, the periods and then ovulation and how you diagnose it. It's a clinical diagnosis, basically. And the same is the clinical hyperandrogenism. 
it's the perception of unwanted face or body hair or alopecia even and has a negative social psychosocial impact and only terminal hairs are relevant in the pathological hirsutism and which is untreated a lot of girls now these these days remove it before they come to you and you have to find find them untreated you have to ask a pointed question about that it has to be more than five millimeters long variable in shape and pigmented hair as well okay and all of us are sort of familiar with the ferman galway good score i won't go to it right at this point in time so it has to be very specifically something that you can see and on top of it biochemical hyperandrogenism Free testosterone is probably one of the most sensitive tests, um, but however, it's cumbersome, costly, not very freely available. Total testosterone, easier to perform and uh, available. And uh, 45 to 60 nanogram per ml is considered upper limit of normal. When it exceeds 150 nanogram per DL, it requires evaluation further. An ultrasound sh alone should not be used, like I said before, for the diagnosis of PCOS. Definitely, definitely in those with a gynecological age of less than eight years, that is less than eight years after menarche, uh, that is the gynecological age due to high incidence of multifollicular ovaries in this life stage. So that alone can never make a diagnosis in anybody and especially in an adolescent. And uh, you can see the numbers where you can pick up that morphology 40% you'll pick up that morphology up until two years after menarche. 35%, these are normal people and normal young ladies. And uh, it cannot be taken as a diagnosis of PCO. And this is a very, very important lesson all of us will have to keep in mind at all times. And there is a technical limitation of abdominal ultrasound in an obese, overweight teenager as well. So the diagnosis of PCOs in adolescents is hyperandrogenism, which is biochemically confirmed menstrual irregularities which are present for more than two years post menarche polycystic ovaries which are increased both in size and increased in the number of follicles and stroma so the main point to take is that not every obese child is a pcos and stringent criteria for adolescents should be applied before you call them pcos because it can give rise to a lot of emotional trauma for a growing youngster to be told that there's something wrong with her ovaries and it creates even more trauma for her parents and her family, anxiety about her future life, future reproductive life, marital life. A whole lot of things happen when we use the term polycystic ovary syndrome without thinking through and making an actual diagnosis. Insulin resistance. Now, this we've looked at. And beyond this, there is something else that we have to be conscious about and look at, which you can pick up clinically in a lot of um, individuals, acanthosis, truncal obesity, Oral GTT is a must when you pick up in evidence of uh, insulin resistance. Other um, factors that we often do are fine to do it for uh, documentation purposes, but they don't necessarily need to be done to make a diagnosis. And you also have to think about in very obese child metabolic syndrome. And metabolic diagnosis of my metabolic syndrome in adolescents also is slightly different from diagnosing metabolic syndrome. We have to be uh, aware of it. Clinically itself, we can pick up a lot with the waist, uh, waist circumference over 90th percentile for age at six, uh, sex. And if you look at an uh, BP, which is higher than what it should be, and the waist circumference where the girl is putting on weight primarily around her waist, you've got to be very, very careful about this girl and her future. Um, so adolescent with normal glucose tolerance, if you pick it up, you should they should be rescreened at least once every two years anyways or more frequently if additional risk factors are identified. And adolescents with impaired glucose tolerance should be screened annually for development of type 2 diabetes. At risk of diagnosis, at risk of PCOS, is that a diagnosis? It is universally now accepted that that can be a very logical diagnosis where you worry about PCOS, but you're not sure about it. So as I said, great caution should be taken before diagnosis PCOS, diagnosing PCOS in adolescent girls. Um, if uh, especially if oligomenorrhea has not persisted for more than two years. But these girls can be considered to be at risk of PCOS and they need to be monitored carefully and uh, rather than misdiagnose uh, pubertal changes as PCOS. And the longitudinal re-evaluation is beneficial and prudent in these little girls. Uh, adolescent PCOS uh, management, of the, now we'll go to the management part of it. Management part of it, now um, when your management of the 
presenting complaints in the management part i would like you to think about it this way you know they come to us with complaints so first of all we have to manage the complaints if you don't manage the complaints and start doing other things parents are not going to be interested the little girl is not going to be interested and i don't think it does gets you anywhere they are concerned about whatever they are coming with and that needs to be looked at so whatever the complaints are that needs to that's the first level of treatment first line of treatment is that just to reiterate everything i think the next level of treatment may not be sufficient with this we'll talk about each one first is the presenting complaint next is what is underlying the presenting complaints and that may be the hyperinsulinism and hyperandrogenemia that we're talking about only treating the complaints is almost like treating uh, typhoid fever with aspirin it, it it does help them but it doesn't help them all the way through it doesn't help the actual disease process inside so we have to treat the complaints at the same time think about what is giving rise to them. Is this hyperinsulinemia in this child? Is this uh, hyperandrogenemia in this child? And what should I do about it should be um, the next thought. And the third part is why does she get into those? And that, again, takes us back to the origins of PCOS. This is why the pathophysiology is important. The origins of PCOS, there's nothing much we can do about the genes, but there may be something that we can do about what made the genes worse which are the environmental factors, which is the diet and the lifestyle. So we have to think of the treatment of PCOS as a three-layered treatment. So first of all, it's management of presenting complaints, a desire for immediate improvement of presenting symptoms, often the focus of patients, families, and the treating physicians. Menstrual dysfunction and hyperandrogenism are the particularly distressing complaints for the adolescents and their families, but are not usually the factors associated with metabolic risk later. So you have to treat these two, but you have to also keep thinking about, as a physician, the metabolic risk, which will happen later. So the principles of management, if you think about it, is correcting the underlying pathophysiology, as well as correcting the resultant clinical problems, which may be the menstrual problem, hirsutism, or metabolic syndrome. So this is what we talked about. We have to do both. And abnormal uterine bleeding, menstrual irregularity, excess, uh, excessive bleeding, immediate attention has to be given. Hyper, uh, cutaneous hyperandrogenism and hirsutism and acne. At a slightly older age group, they may present to you with infertility. And there, that is the focus of attention that you definitely have to take rather than anything else. And obesity and insulin resistance in the long term. But the long term goals will all have to always have to stay stay in your mind even as you're starting the treatment abnormal bleeding uh, one is the psychosocial problems it's the commonest presenting complaint can give rise to severe anemia and we also have to get worried about the fact that if it is left for a longer period of time the anovulatory cycles constant from a very early young age group can give rise to endometrial hypoplasia and even endometrial carcinoma at a very young age so what do we manage it with? We manage it, all of us know that we manage it with combined oral contraceptives, which contain both estrogen and progesterone. This can be used as a first line treatment for treating AUB with abnormal menstrual bleeding and, and or cutaneous signs of androgen excess. So COCs contain estrogen and progesterone. So this is suppression of HBO axis, increased androgen production. Progesterones inhibit the endometrial proliferation. So that's very important. So besides correcting the cycles, this is the very important thing, very important reason for using combined oral contraceptives is to prevent endometrial proliferation in the long term and endometrial hyperplasia as well. The choice of the agents is uh, variable. Earlier on, antiandrogenic, progestogenic, estrogens always remain the same. And generally, it's advisable not to go for a 20 microgram pill rather than uh, 20 microgram choose a 30 microgram or 35 because when they're coming to you with a men menstrual problem a they may be overweight also b uh, the endometrium might be very thickened and a 20 microgram pill may or may not hold that endometrium and you may not correct the aub as efficiently as you'd like to so it might be better to choose a pill with uh, 30 or 35 micrograms of ethanol estradiol anti androgen cpv uh, ciproteron acetate was the choice a while ago, but that's being questioned now because of the fact that uh, 
venous thromboembolism was higher in that particular progesterone, thrombotic strokes were higher, even MIs occurred, salt and fluid retention was more, and it doesn't allow you to effectively produce any weight loss. So there are problems that you face when you're using COCs. And as I said, you have to choose your progesterone very carefully and also have to think about the both benefits and the risks, okay? So the benefits at that moment outweigh the potential risks in the long run. So you will be using the COC, but in the longer run, you'll have to think about the negative adverse metabolic risks of using COCs for a very long period of time as well. So this is the next question, which comes from, she's okay, you've given her the COC, she goes back home, three periods are okay, you've initially given it for three periods, she comes back in three months, and how much is the optimal duration? Has anybody defined it? Okay, you would not find too much of a definition there, but there is a statement from a majority of authorities saying that you can continue the treatment until the patient is gynecologically mature, which is five years post-menarchal, it helps you to do other things or if she loses a substantial amount of excess weight, starts having her periods, then it might be a reason for stopping it as well. So you have to do everything simultaneously. And if it looks like the other factors are going well, you may be able to stop it. You don't have to give it for five years. You can stop in between and start again if it is needed, but you have to tell the educate the patients and the mother that it is not a short-term treatment do not expect everything to change in three months period of time because it's an underlying genetic thing but however if we work at it we may be able to make it better on your own without the needing medications in the long run is that advice that we'll have to give them but is there another alternative the patient comes back in three months and she's not happy in taking the pill every day and the parents know that it's a contraceptive pill and within quotes, a hormone, which they don't want to keep giving her child, the child for a long period of time, and they would prefer not to do it, and they prefer to stop it. So to stop it, it comes back again sometime later, and they go to another one, get another different type of pill. This is a story I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Is there another thing, something else, if somebody doesn't want to use or, uh, oral contraceptives at all, that we can choose, and what it can do? Progesterones can be chosen when COCs cannot be used for whatever reason, whether it's a patient reason or uh, if it's a family history of DVDs, or the woman has a thrombophilia carrier or whatever your reasons are, you're concerned about other negative effects and metabolic effects also, you can choose to use progestins. Progestin can be used cyclically every month or even every six weeks. Any type of progesterone can be practically used, but just to use it long enough for it to shed the endometrium properly. It can be anywhere from seven to 10 days. It can be micronized progesterone, MPA. A lot of people are using even Dufestron now and uh, menstrual irregularity becomes corrected. She comes to you with a problem of menstrual irregularity. You can correct it with using progesterone alone rather than COCs. But however, it does not reduce the androgen levels. If she came to you with higher um, levels of androgen and hirsutism, that doesn't respond and there's no reduction in hirsutism and it's not useful in correcting hyperandrogenism unless it's a specific type of uh, COC and uh, mood symptoms are there in some people, bloating, breast soreness, and all of that is there. And that is uh, where you have to think about other options as well. Managing hyperandrogenism, the uh, other type of a patient who comes in where the primary problem is hyperandrogenism, over 50% of PCOS adolescents have a problem with uh, hyperandrogenism as well. It can be hirsutism. We all know that it can be with local meshes initially. Hormonal therapy can help. It's just that uh, you have to choose your progesterones to carefully. And the goal of hormone therapy is to decrease the effect of androgen. So COCs do two things. It will correct the cycle. It will also reduce the androgen production. Only thing it doesn't correct is the metabolic problem. And that's where you have to be careful about. So the hirsutism, topical agents, physical approaches, hormone therapy and if uh, and oral contraceptives and if all of them do not correct it and choosing the right progesterone also is crucial i talked about ciproteron acetate now not being used in most of the countries because of the side effects that it has and it uh, boils down to drosperinone containing oral contraceptives that you'll be choosing and if all this does not work and hyperandrogenemia is a problem 
and you can resort to antiandrogens as well. They act by in inhibiting androgen-induced transformation of vellus hairs into terminal hairs, and uh, that can be prescribed. One of the major antiandrogens that gets used these days more commonly is spironolactone because uh, the other ones do have side effects which are not acceptable in a teenager. So if you need to use antiandrogens in these age groups, spironolactone should be the agent that you choose. Now, she's come to you with either irregular periods or hirsutism, and we've managed it. Does it stop there? Does it stop with managing only the irregular periods or the hirsutism? Should we think about anything more? Is there anything that we think about it additionally? Uh, uh, COCs are the most effective, simplest, least e expensive therapy, of course, but there's a low compliance rate. But more than that, what we have to worry about is unfavorable effect on lipids and glucose metabolism and super added cardiovascular morbidity in the longer run. Okay, that becomes our responsibility because you cannot put a 15 year old on an OCP and say that you keep taking it forever kind of a thing. So long term use has practical problems as well, which is where you have to go back and look at what made this child into a PCO and can I do something about it which will help her lifestyle as well. This is where the treating insulin resistance comes into play. Metformin often needs to be used as an adjunct to lifestyle modifications and symptom-based treatment. Dysglycemia and insulin resistance should be definitely considered as an indication for metformin. And uh, it should be considered for long-term management and you may say that how long term is long term, you look, use it uh, long term and make sure that she's doing the other things to reduce her weight and lifestyle changes. And it's known to improve menstrual function in the longer run. You might have heard uh, a discordant advice about metformin. You don't have to put it for everybody, but we have to remember that the obesity, the incidence of uh, the obese child with PCOS, incidence of uh, insulin resistance is very, very high. And even in the skinny um, yeah, adolescent with PCOS, there is still a very considerable incidence of insulin resistance. So we have to improve the menstrual dysfunction, decrease the androgen levels, and to prevent the metabolic complications, something like metformin to reduce, uh, to make the uh, metabolism better becomes uh, important. So there's a favorable effect on glucose and lipid metabolism prevents type 2 diabetes mellitus in the long term, cardiovascular morbidity in the long term, helps in weight reduction. When combined with OCP, the effects on lipid profile and BMI balances the negative effect of OCP on these parameters. But do we have to again use only metformin? This child uses metformin for a period of time, she either cannot tolerate it, or the parents, uh, when they're buying the drug, are told that it's a diabetic drug, and they don't want their child to be on a diabetic drug, they want to have something different. Okay, something different that you can give who will, which will achieve the same thing. That is the role for myoinositol as an alternative. It's a component of vitamin B complex. It's an insulin sensitizer, which improves insulin sig signaling and reduces serum insulin levels, and therefore decreases serum testosterone and restores normal ovulatory function in PCO women. So it does, it just goes back that one step further in the pathophysiology, and either metformin or myoinositol can be used. And why do we need to have an alternative for uh, metformin at all? What, why, and how? What, and we've looked at what are inositols and how it in, uh, improves the glucose transports into the cells, decreases uh, insulin resistance, reduces hyperinsulinemia, and then therefore decreases the hyperandrogenemia and the long term metabolic parameters. And that is why it is, uh, and you need to use both DCA and MI. And uh, my, the, in uh, myoinostol works majorly on ovary and the organs like even the heart and the brain, but the, and DCA works in the periphery for insulin resistance. It actually improves the glucose metabolism and uh, converts the glucose into glycogen into storage. So both need to be used together to have the optimal effect. So myoinostol when BCP is not improving the metabolic profile, I, again, my by BCP when used in combination with myoinistol showed considerable improvement in the metabolic profile. So you can use both and have a symptomatic uh, improvement as well as improvement in the metabolic profile. And myoinistol in combination with BCP can prevent future development of serious metabolic disturbances in adolescents with PCOS. In adolescent PCOS, particularly myoinistol is safe, 
and effective to prevent and correct metabolic disorders in adolescent PCOS. And combination, as we said, can have a beneficial effect on all of the negative metabolic uh, problems that are there in this individual. And uh, on the base, a simultaneous treatment with MI and OCPs on the basis of lifestyle modification can be considered as a highly effective approach to in adolescent PCOS. Physiological ratio still remains, it's, it's, even though it's different in different cells, this seems to work better for uh, conversion of glucose into glycogen as well. And then we go back one step further beyond uh, the immediate causative factors, which is either the insulin or the androgen to primary prevention. And uh, that is the lifestyle modifications and regular exercise, which has to be an, and a diet change, which has to be an integral part of what we need to do. Um, this is why you require things like um, PCOS clinic. It is not just a prescription that we can do for these young ladies and their parents. It is to reduce their anxiety and make a lifetime change. And the, all the other modifications become just as important, if not more important. They need to be worked together psychologically and physically. You need to provide opportunity for them. You need to see them again and again and to modify their lifestyle uh, and keep track of their lifestyle and how much they are achieving with their advice that they get on the uh, exercise and diet. It is a time consuming thing for a busy obstetrician or a gynecologist sitting in the clinic, but we have to somehow make it possible in our clinics or we should have in every city dedicated the PCOS clinics which can achieve this. And I think uh, the PCO societies are also now promoting this uh, uh, establishment of PCOS clinics. So the acute symptoms can be treated with combinations of OCP and either myo install and metformin for three to six months. This is one way of doing it. And the maintenance depends on what they achieve in these six months. Maintenance, many of them may not require OCP beyond that six months, so we can afford to stop it and put them continue with myo-install my or metformin. And then when there is an improved cycle regularity, when they have lost weight, when they're doing well on their own, even that can be rethought. Uh, administration of medications need to be rethought at, at that particular time. The, how do you choose, choose between metformin and myo-install? Metformin is less expensive, time-tested, but then it has more side, GI side effects and a lot less compliance. MI, the main problem is more expensive. It's a newer drug, but it has been proved as of now, and it is much more user friendly. So you have to decide on uh, on the basis of what the patient can afford and what she likes taking. You can you have to decide between either one of them. So the behavioral strategies are also important. Lifestyle interventions uh, can include, must include. Goal setting, self-monitoring, stimulus control, problem solving, assertiveness, slow rating, reinforcing changes, relapse prevention. You need to see how many things need to be done with this young individual to make her stick to your treatment. If we end up just giving her a prescription for a medication, this will may not work in the long period of time. It will work in controlling her symptoms in the immediate period of time. From, but your long time goal should be very different and you should have the ability to convince this youngster that that's the way you have to go. So management, first line is non-pharmacological, of course, and as far as the dietary thing goes, it's healthy lifestyle, reduced carbohydrate intake, and uh, exercise can reduce the hepatovisceral fat, and diet, uh, reduced calories can work, and reduced uh, carbohydrates can work as well. A greater decrease in weight, total and abdominal fat mass was observed uh, in overweight women after high protein, versus low protein diets in most, but not all studies. So that does work. And exercise at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity. You have to get them to keep a diary about their diet, about their exercise. You have to bring them back periodically and have your dietitian check them, have your uh, physio check them, and see whether they've really done it, recorded it and done it. And the activities can be a sustained activity for 60 minute or 10 minute bouts in, uh, which can be about 1,000 steps, it's easier to say that, and aiming to achieve at least 30 minutes daily in most days, and a minimum of 250 minutes per week of moderate intensity activities or vigorous activity over lesser time. And regular monitoring of weight change and excess weight is important. Monitoring could be at each visit at a minimum of 6 to 12 months monthly intervals later, and with frequency planned and agreed upon 
between the healthy health and well professional and the individual and height weight and ideally base circumference should be measured and BMI calculated. I've said all this and I have said nothing about surgery for PCOS and uh, is it a deliberate uh, omission or is it something that uh, you should think rethink about I think the answer is should you should rethink laparoscopy for ovarian surgery with all that we said it's an organ that's now affected okay and burning the ovaries is not the solution for treating PCOS it does work in a specific situation and that specific situation is when their problem is anovulation and infertility and your oral obelogens don't work punctures and limited number of punctures can correct ovulation temporarily and temporarily only because the local testosterone levels fall so i'm not saying it never works in this very small given indication it can work temporarily but even there i don't think it is the right kind of a thing to do to burn a reproductive organ because more and more we are seeing these burnt ovary syndromes rather than the PCO syndrome in our referral infertility clinics when uh, when you're running a tertiary level infertility clinic you see them so often that it is so distressing and I think there are better ways of treating them gonadotropins can do that but infertility is a different topic that we're not going to get into today basically it is looking at uh, PCOS is a metabolic disease and dealing with it for a lifetime rather than treating with uh, treating it with a medication for a short period of time. So the take-home messages today are it's a PCOS is a misnomer because it's not the ovary. Suggested alternative is reproductive metabolic syndrome. Definitely not a sonographic diagnosis and it should not be diagnosed based on a single criteria or a single biochemical parameter. And we don't do things like FSH and LH and altered ratios and such do not need to be done to diagnose PCOS. Biochemical evaluation is done only to rule out other causes mostly. But in youngsters, we have to do it uh, for uh, hyperandrogenemia especially. Strict criteria need to be applied in diagnosis, especially in adolescents. And we, but we have to catch them young and uh, early treatment is crucial to prevent the long-term complications, most particularly in infertility and cardiovascular disease. Um, metabolic screening and treatment should be done periodically. Lifestyle modification is of paramount importance in preventing metabolic complications later in life. And this is the crux of the, the whole thing of treating a PCOS young lady. Symptom-oriented treatment will also be re required, of course, in youngsters especially. Thank you. And the families need to be sensitize that PCOS is not an easy to treat disorder. Long-term treatment is needed. Siblings need to be evaluated and sometimes the parents need to be screened as well. So polycystic disease uh, syndrome is a syndrome and not a disease. Let's control it and not try to cure it. Thank you. Ma'am, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I think the audience got to learn a lot from your vast experience. Uh, I'm Dr. Kiran from uh, Shield Medical Affairs, ma'am. Uh, already we have quite a lot of questions, ma'am. So with your yeah. kind permission, I'll, I'll, I'll read out the questions to you and you can answer, ma'am. Okay, ma sure, sure. Uh, uh, ma'am, the first question is from Dr. Veena Rani, and she yeah. asks, uh, in case of adolescent PCOS, for how many months the treatment should be given? Um, this is what I was talking about. Now. It depends on what her problem is. And uh, generally, the, the last uh, one slide that I said, you first treat for six months. You mentally prepare them, whether it's hyperandrogenism or hyperinsulinemia, it's not going to go away uh, in a month or two. You may need to try, correct the cycles and you may need to deal with uh, the hirsutism as well. So the initial treatment itself, I think you should psychologically make them ready for six months. You review them in three months to see whether they're doing the diet and the exercise and everything well. But you give them the first three months, you repeat it for another three months after you check them if she's not complying with it. And if the weight hasn't changed and the waist circumference hasn't changed, BMI hasn't changed, you have to counsel them a little bit more vigorously. But six months is the time. And if she's done well, if she's lost weight and it's time to stop the oral contraceptive and see what she does, and if she's doing okay. And there are, um, uh, touch wood, there are people who do very well who, by losing weight. And we all know the stories of PCOS who lose weight and get their periods on their own. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, ma'am, the next question is from Dr. Pungo Dai. Uh, she asks, uh, when you have mild cases of PCOS, 
and yeah. then there are no complaints and it is an incidental diagnosis is it mandatory to treat uh, the patient in this kind of scenarios exactly that was the the whole object of treating is there is no such a thing as a mild case of pcos okay it is either pcos not a pcos okay not every obese child is a pcos and if she has significant hirsutism significant uh, irregular cycles giving rise to problems those are required to make a diagnosis of pcos and if they are distressing for her we have to give her relief thank you ma'am uh, and the next question is from dr malligeshwari uh, yes. she asks if you have a, a thin pco girls with high uh, uh, irregular periods how do you manage with the thinner ones are actually more difficult to manage than the uh, obese ones lifestyle changes may or may not make that much of a difference here the thinner girls are usually a problem for us to treat infertility as well because they are thin ones with very high lh levels and an ovary which has got that uh, necklace pattern and they hyperstimulate like crazy when you start stimulation stimulating in um, for them there you have to wonder and you have to definitely assess the androgen levels and if the androgen levels are high you may have to assess them but there also choosing the right kind of oral contraceptive with the right kind of progesterone would be fine ma'am the next question is from dr chandra uh, uh, again it's related to uh, adolescent pco and menstruation ma'am so uh, she asks uh, when uh, treating the adolescent girls who menstruate for few months and then suddenly become um, oligomenorrhic how do we proceed and if so for how long i think that educating them right in the beginning that this is a lifetime thing and uh, it will come back if they don't look after themselves a lot of times it comes back because of specific reasons and the specific reasons may be whatever exercise they were doing or diet that they were doing they might have quit or another thing that we are seeing very very frequently is uh, the plus 2 the school finishing the cramming that they do the stress levels being very high the cortisol levels being very high and then it comes back again you know the problem comes back again there we may have to put them on oral contraceptive back again educating them telling them that once they finish those exams and the stress they have to concentrate on physical exercise activity and uh, everything else that they can do Ma'am, the next question is from uh, Dr. Manisha, uh, and she asks: uh, uh, When you when you advise uh, ultrasound for PCOS patient, uh, is consideration of the day of menstrual cycle important? Uh, yes, it is important because it's early. It has to be the follicular phase, early uh, follicular phase. You, there is no point in doing it later, and uh, because uh, once the ovulation happens, the ovary is going to look different. so whether you uh, assess whether they're trying to assess and make a diagnosis of pco or whether you're going to assess ovarian reserve if you're treating infertility it has to be done around day 5 6 early part of uh, uh, the menstrual cycle thank you ma'am uh, and the next question is from dr anupama goel uh, she wants to know uh, how to treat a 9 year old girl with pubark with a persistent mother who thinks that the child is suffering from some severe disease I know, I know. It's not easy. It's not easy, but you can convince them that it can, and it does. It is not always a sign of PCO, and it may be purely innocuous. What I would do is I'll check her androgens, all androgen levels, just to make sure that they're not missing an adrenal pathology or something else. Okay, and if it's a DHEA, DHEAS, that's going to be more from adrenal rather than from the ovary. But uh, you can tell them that occasionally it may be an indication of something like a PCOS. or you you can say that she can follow through and there's nothing wrong in just waiting and uh, seeing how she goes thank and you ma'am no need for any medication okay uh, thank you ma'am uh, and the next question is from dr darshana uh, she wants to know what is the youngest age uh, at which we can start uh, uh, combined ovaries i wouldn't start it too early because because you have your bone age and the fusion of the uh, whatever i think it's uh, better not to start them when they are too young and it's better to wait until they are 16 at least before you start and then the next question is from dr pratima ma'am uh, and she wants to know uh, can we consider using serms in uh, adolescent pcos serms for exactly treating what uh, she is not mentioned but she just it is a broad question serms in adolescent pcos selective estrogen receptor modifiers are something that you use when the endometrium is very thick 
or you know so when there is an evidence of uh, too much of estrogen but being too much of estrogen is here or the too much of estrogen effect on the endometrium is here because of another pathology so just decreasing the level of estrogen is probably not the right way to approach it it may work but it's probably not the right way to approach it. Um, and the, uh, next question is about uh, ciproptorin. Uh, it's asked by Dr. Sunita. Uh, mm -hmm. She asks, she, she says, it is mentioned that it takes uh, ciproptorin as at least uh, 9 to 12 months uh, after using it to notice the effect. So, how long can we use uh, COC con containing uh, ciproptorin plus uh, 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 COC? I think that's a question. Okay. I, I did make a point in the talk itself that ciproptorin uh, state is going away. People don't use it anymore. And a lot of countries uh, have stopped even marketing uh, BCPs containing ciproterone acetate because the incidence of uh, DVTs is much higher in there. Okay, the incidence of clotting problems is much higher. So I think uh, coagulation problems are occurring much more often. Therefore, ciproterone acetate is not used. Drosperinone is the favored one. And uh, drosperinone containing OCPs on the whole can be used for a prolonged period of time as well. You know, if you take youngsters in countries like U.S., often OCPs containing drosperinone for contraceptive purposes are used for years together. But here in this situation, we usually take three months at a time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the next question is from Dr. Harita. She asks, uh, she, she gives a case scenario uh, where we have a 17-year-old adolescent with regular periods obese with hirsutism. Uh, what is the investigation of choice in these cases, ma'am? 17-year-old with obese with her citizen. Uh, okay, then she's probably not a PCOS. Not a PCOS. Somebody, when, you, when we talked about it and we said you need all three parameters, an ovulation, and you need to have the androgenization, and you need to have the ultrasound, all three to make a diagnosis of PCO. So somebody with very regular periods, this may be the category that I talked about watch. Okay, watch may turn out to be a PCOS later, which is probably not a PCOS, but if it's hirsutism by itself is significant, I will do the androgen levels, adrenal androgen levels, as well as ovarian androgen levels, which is DHEA, DHEAS, and uh, uh, testosterone, just so I don't miss the adrenal pathology. And uh, if it is ovarian and there's just too much of estrogens, uh, too, too much of testosterone, you can treat it with uh, one of the antiandrogens if necessary. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the next question about uh, myositol is from Dr. Shweta Agarwal from uh, Hyderabad. Uh, so, what she asks is, uh, uh, with the uh, perspective of myositol, should it be given in tablet or uh, powder formulation, which is better? You must have asked Mr. Balaji to say that. I will talk about it anyways, because the volume that you need to give is so large, okay, it is not uh, 500 milligrams. It is much larger than that, so any, anywhere from 2 to 4 grams is what you need to give. And that kind of a volume, it's difficult for a pharmaceutical company to make a tablet out of it. Okay, so when you're giving appropriate volumes, it often comes as granules. So that is where the granules come in. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, the next question is from Dr. Sunita. Uh, she asks, uh, when we are treating these uh, uh, adolescent girls with myositol, uh, for how many months can we put the patient on myositol? There is no time limit. You can. It depends on the patient and what you need to do. If you're comfortable with it, remember that it's only a, a, one of the vitamins, B vitamins. Okay, so right. it is something that's sold off the counter in the Western countries. Okay, so it's a safe drug, and if it's, they are happy with it, they're doing well with it. They can take it as long as they wish to to keep the whole thing under control. Uh, Ma'am, again, uh, uh, one more question related to decarinacetol, the same situation. Uh, in uh, uh, young adolescents, how long can uh, decarinacetol uh, be given? I think it's still better to use it in the 40 is to 1 ratio. Uh, Ma'am, uh, the next question is uh, uh, from Dr. Lalit. Uh, they want to know, like, uh, uh, what is the upper limit of uh, ovarian volume? Uh, if volume increases, uh, what should be the treatment of choice? If the volume of over 10 ml, 10 cc, is uh, considered as the volume where you should think about abnormal ovarian volume, increased ovarian volume. So it's 10 cc, and you do not treat the ovary, please. You do not treat the ovary. You find out why it is larger. And if you think it's PCOS, treat it any other way but surgery. 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, ma'am, uh, the next question is from Dr. Murugapriya. Uh, she wants to know in lean PCOS, uh, does uh, diet management play a role? Yeah, it does. You don't have to have a calorie restriction, but you can have a carbohydrate restriction. A good 40 to 50 percent of lean PPOs also have insulin uh, resistance. And there, uh, I think modifying the diet plays a role, especially in India. And I'm from South India, and I, I know the diet is carbohydrate heavy. On top of it, most of the youngsters in India are now growing up with chocolates and Coke and whatever. Okay. So, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the next question is from Dr. Sita Ramaraju. Uh, he wants to know, uh, dear madam, uh, uh, is there any role of melatonin in uh, PCOS management? There are a lot of other agents like melatonin. Um, I haven't really come across very convincing argument that it's a fundamental drug. Uh, it may have a role, but it's not. Uh, we are not right there yet. Um, the next question is from Dr. Supriya. Uh, is combining metformin with myositol good in terms of treatment for the patients? Metformin and myositol both given together. It's an interesting thought, but uh, both are uh, both decreased insulin resistance. Both actually work with different pathways, um, metformin and myositol. So there is also there are articles that claim that when you use both together, the uh, effect can be additive to each other and can be more. But again, it's not a very uh, large studies being done um, about the efficacy of such a combination. Right. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Fahir uh, Khan. Um, they want to know what is the line of treatment uh, in case of obese 25 year old patient with uh, post complete thyroidectomy for uh, papillary carcinoma? Papillary carcinoma and thyroid? And uh, what has she got? Uh, 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 the patient is 25, year, uh, 25 years old, patient is obese. Uh, yeah. Patient has just completed a thyroidectomy for papillary carcinoma. Does she have a PCOS? Yes, yes, ma'am. Twenty-five-year-old obese PCOS. You can she can put her on first of all diet and exercise, and uh, the cycles to be regular. Balance her uh, thyroid. Uh, I mean, thyroxin levels as well. That the endocrinologist will probably do for you after the treatment and the oncologist together. And, uh, we here we have to just make sure that. Uh, you need normal levels of thyroxine as well. That we have to assure about. And here, if uh, she's anovulatory, you can just use a progesterone withdrawal as well. Um, I'm still lots of questions coming. So shall we take a few more or uh, uh, shall I mail you the questions? Okay, ma'am? I can be here for another five or ten minutes. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, uh, uh, the next question is from Dr. Lillid. Uh, how to manage women who are getting only hormonal withdrawal bleeding? Then again, you know, it may be uh, what kind of hormones you're using for withdrawal bleeding. If you're using progesterone and she withdraws and bleeds, it means that she's got enough estrogen in there to for the endometrium to grow. And then it sheds with progesterone only. But if she needs both estrogens and progesterone for a withdrawal bleeding, it means that fundamentally she's not even producing estrogens. So that is the only information that you get. And then you have to decide on why you know if she's uh, progesterone only if she's withdrawing and bleeding she's not ovulating obviously so she's not producing any progesterones on her own so you have to find out why she's not ovulating is it something like environmental i told you like how kids do that in uh, class uh, 12 often it happens or is it really pco you have to look at everything and decide Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Sita Ramaraju. Uh, he wants to know about uh, uh, to get um, um, LH levels uh, and AMH before LOD. What is your uh, uh, what are your thoughts about that? I do not even do LOD. I do run a, a tertiary level infertility unit. I don't think I've done an LOD for the last eight years, ten years, and I managed to get all of my PCOD ovulate and conceive without that. Uh, um, and the next question is from Dr. Aishwarya. Uh, what is the right kind of progesterone uh, for adolescents? Uh, is drosperidone okay? Yeah, drosperidone is fine. Um, and the next question is about what is the role of uh, uh, AMH in adolescent PCO? AMH is not a very diagnostic tool in PCO. 
it's discouraged that you use AMH for diagnosing PCO. Uh, AMH is much more useful when you are trying to find out the ovarian reserve or trying to have your uh, schedule of uh, uh, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation in an ART. It's an essential uh, test to do. But just to diagnose AMH, in a, especially in an adolescent, is probably not the ideal test. It's not encouraged. It's the ideal. Uh, ma'am, uh, the next question is from Dr. Prasanna. Uh, they give a, a case scenario, ma'am. I think I'll just read it for you. Uh, there is a 26-year-old uh, Nulli Paris uh, woman with uh, previous ectopic pregnancy with uh, salpingectomy, with uh, other tube hydrosalpings, uh, but patient with bilateral uh, PCOD uh, treatment option, please ex explain as she is anxious to con conceive and uh, the husband's parameters are normal. But Patient and patient with bilateral PCOD treatment option, please explain that she's an so she doesn't have either tube that's working. One is gone, another one is not working. Okay. And the only way you can go is with an ART, assisted reproductive technology and IVF. And PCOD is not a, a contraindication for IVF. In fact, we are very happy with PCO patients because we always get love for oocytes. Right. Uh, uh, and the next question is from Dr. Sumita Lakshmi. Uh, drosperidone also has some side effects, probably the uh, aldosterone or sodium retention issues. Can yeah. you clarify how long is the safety profile of uh, ocicles uh, established? Any warning signs uh, when to stop ocicles? I think that's an excellent point. Uh, yes, it does have, but a lot less than other uh, anti-androgenic agents that you can use. So. And as long as the patient is tolerating it and you don't have much of a problem with the patient tolerating it, you can use it. Right. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma uh, one question from Dr. Aruna. Uh, how to treat a 16-year-old uh, girl with uh, hirsutism, uh, menorrhagia, and uh, leave? Hirsutism alone with the diagnosis of PCOS or without the diagnosis of PCOS make it, makes a difference. If it's only hirsutism, I think uh, I will again go for androgen assays and finding out where the androgen is coming from and then try to treat it accordingly. It actually goes back to the same thing, local and dermatologist treatment and plus getting the androgen levels down from wherever they are. And if it's PCOS, they may have to look at uh, all of its uh, manifestations. From what you're saying, it could be somebody with a PCO because you have hirsutism and you have an AUB where it might the endometrium thicker because of unopposed progesterone and uh, unopposed um, estrogen action. So you may need to treat her like we talked about with the BCP and uh, either metformin or myelin. Okay, ma'am. Uh, uh, ma uh, 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 one last question from uh, 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 my side, ma'am. If it's okay, I can ask one question to you. Sure. Ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Nowadays, in a lot of conferences, uh, we hear that uh, if you have a strong genetic history. And mm -hmm. uh, if the intracrine uh, uh, environment is polluted, uh, uh, like this person Baxter and Rupam, they've looked at a lot of factors. Um, okay. uh, they say the, those things influence the, the patients uh, developing or, or, or the fetus developing uh, uh, PCOD uh, milestones faster. Uh, your comments on this, man? Yeah, uh, that's exactly the where I started my whole presentation with. First of all, the child should inherit the type of genes that it predisposes it to for developing PCOS. And the intrauterine environment, especially if the mother is a PCOD, mother is an uncontrolled PCOD, she has got metabolic problems, all of them are going to have an effect on that baby. Okay. So if the mother, if I would say that a mother, before she conceives, if she's truly a PCOD, she should have her metabolic uh, profile regulated before she conceives, if it's possible at all. Can can we, uh, yeah, go ahead, um, go ahead. There was one question I saw. Can we use dihydrogestron in adolescence for withdrawal bleeding? Yes, we can. Uh, so, I, I, ma'am, there are lots of questions. Uh, the other questions, I mail it across to you and get your answers and circulate to the doctors, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there are a lot of compliments coming in, ma'am. Uh, as usual, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, uh, I think, ma'am, uh, especially in these pandemic times when we are searching for this word, uh, uh, new normal, uh, <laughs> I think uh, this goes a long way, ma'am, to educate the doctors. And I'm sure they had a great uh, learning experience, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for sparing your time. Uh, for thank you, time. all of you, uh, the company, Mr. Balaji, and all of those who've been listening to me to spend this precious 60 minutes. 
in this time with me. Thank you. And all the best for all of you. Hope you do well with the, in this difficult times. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.